All right, I'm going to start. All right, I'm going to start. Everybody. All right, so this is my senior lecture. Um, when I was thinking of topics for the senior lecture, I had a lot of different ideas. Um, a lot of different things I wanted to talk about. Um, I thought about doing funny chief complaints. So over the last three or four years, I've actually been searching Quadrumed, collecting these. Um, and I wanted to share them with you guys. I thought this one was pretty good. I like to think the triage nurse had a sense of humor here. Uh, when I eat sweat, I feel funny. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, everybody at Kings County has to have like four different organ systems involved in their chief complaint. I thought this one was a little excessive. Uh, and this one was just ridiculous. Um, I thought about doing a wellness lecture, so like talking to the juniors about how you're going to get through it, this is my recommendations, but then I figured I'd just be telling you you should exercise more, so I figured better not. Uh, I was going to do a lecture on things that annoy me, but we only had like an hour. Uh, so in the end, I decided I'm going to be in attending next year, I'm going to be teaching residents. Um, there's a lot of stuff that still confuses me that I still need to kind of wrap my mind around, so I figured I'd do like a random assortment of things that I want to figure out before I'm in attending so I don't look stupid. Uh, so that's going to be my senior lecture. <laughs> And also so I take good care of patients. Um, so there's a lot of different things I wanted to talk about, but there's four things that I came up with that I think I could really deal with kind of getting my mind around before I become an attending so that when the residents ask me, oh, why do you do things this way, I'll have a good answer for them. So one is who really needs a troponin? Two is who really needs blood cultures? Who really needs a C-collar? And should we be intubating cardiac arrest patients? Uh, these are the four things I'm going to talk about. So first thing, who really needs a troponin? Um, to talk about troponins, you first have to understand the three laws of troponin testing. So first, all troponin comes from the heart. Um, second, any troponin is worse than no troponin. And third, more troponin is worse than less troponin. <laughs> so there's all these studies out there. Um, <laughs> Looking at patients and the association between an elevated troponin mortality and almost in a linear fashion, your troponin, if it's elevated, is associated with higher mortality and the higher the troponin, the higher the mortality. Even in asymptomatic patients, so one study, uh, the highest levels of troponin they found in asymptomatic patients increased their five-year mortality from 2% to 30%. Um, so one in third of those patients were dead at the end of five years and that was just with one test being elevated. Um, so the argument for troponin testing is, won't you want to know if it's positive? If it's associated with such high mortality, you know it's coming from the heart, you know it's a sign of uh, injury to the heart, wouldn't you want to kind of screen everybody? Um, maybe it'll change your disposition. The other argument for it, uh, we got, we're really good at not missing ACS in the emergency room, um, and troponin testing is a obviously integral part of that. Uh, we know that ACS can present in really kind of vague ways, like weakness um, in the diabetic patient, the elderly patient. And then on top of all that, the number one reason for a successful lawsuit against the ED doc is missing an acute MI. So you take all this stuff together, it's associated with mortality, you might miss an MI, you might get sued, patients might die. Why not just send a troponin on literally every patient, and if it comes back positive, you'll say, okay, let's just admit them. My argument against that is uh, it's a very nonspecific test. So over the years, troponins have sacrificed a lot of their specificity for increased sensitivity. Um, and so the cut point for an abnormal result has gotten lower and lower and lower. So you see in 1995, the cut point for an abnormal result was 1.5. 2007 is 0.04. And with the high sensitivity troponins, it's even lower. So we're finding positive troponins in all these patients that we we're not finding them in before, and it's kind of unclear how clinically useful this is. And the reason is there's a ton of different things that we're now realizing can cause a positive troponin. Um, so this 
These are all things that can cause an elevated troponin that are not ACS. Uh, like the green section is myocardial strain. So literally anything that stretches a myocyte can trigger apoptosis and release a troponin. Um, that could be CHF, that could be pulmonary hypertension. That could just be chronic hypertension. Um, and then the, the yellow and the red are the things that we're more familiar with, like demand ischemia, like an oxygen supply demand mismatch, or a type 2 n um, Anything that decreases oxygen supply, so like anemia, hypovolemia, can cause increased troponin. And then anything that increases demand, so like a tachycardia, like AFib with RVR, SVT. Um, the last two I thought were interesting. So in our CKD and stroke patients, the reason that people think we, they get elevated troponins is because of excessive sympathetic activity. And so it actually just stresses the heart out, and that's why they're releasing a troponin. It's not really the like failure to clear it renally. Um, but you'll notice none of this is ACS. The whole point of troponin testing in the first place was to help us with diagnosing ACS, ruling out MI, but it's going to be positive in all these situations, so it's kind of unclear what to do clinically. Uh, and then what about these patients? So a 90-year-old guy comes into your ED and he says, I've been feeling weak for a while. Are you going to send a troponin on that guy? Uh, there's a study D'Souza sent out recently, I think. I don't even know if it's come out yet. Um, but <laughs> it looked at troponin testing in patients over 65, and it found that 20 and patients over 65 who came in with like a vague chief complaint. 20% um, of them will have a positive troponin, 1% of them will have ACS, and none of the patients in their study actually had any intervention or anything done about it. Um, so that's one in five patients you're going to find a positive troponin. So those are kind of two sides of the argument. Um, my conclusion on this is if you're just concerned for ACS at all and understand that it can present really atypically, um, then yeah, you should send a troponin on these people because that's the whole point of it. And then everybody else, uh, it's kind of complicated. I think it's fine if you send a troponin, just ask yourself two questions. What are you gonna do when it comes back positive? And do you really think it's gonna change your management? So I think in some situations it might, uh, like a patient with a submassive P, maybe that'll push you more towards one more aggressive treatment than less aggressive. Uh, someone having a CHF exacerbation, maybe they'll push you more toward admitting them than not. I don't think you need a troponin to make you, help you make those clinical decisions, but maybe it's just another piece of evidence. Uh, I would say if you send a troponin on someone and then it comes back positive and you're like, shit, I really wish I didn't send that troponin, just repeat it. Repeat it in the ED and understand that there are all these reasons that that troponin could be elevated and they don't necessarily, if they're not having an acute exacerbation of something like this, they don't necessarily need to stay in the hospital for it. Repeat it in the ED, if it is stable, you can consider discharging them with cardiology follow-up for a workup of one of any of those chronic conditions that can cause an elevated troponin. So it's not super clear, but I think definitely, if you're thinking ACS, send it, and then just ask yourself, what am I gonna do when this comes back positive? Is this really gonna help me out or not? Um, and if it comes back positive, don't just admit them for a positive troponin. Maybe repeat it. Maybe think about what's causing it and consider discharging them. All right. Uh, second thing I wanted to talk about. So who really needs blood cultures? So first off, I was wondering, why do we send blood cultures on patients? Um, I actually couldn't come up with a good answer, so I had to look it up. It's, the primary reason is to identify resistant strains. So... This is like you're treating someone with antibiotics and it turns out that they're resistant to that antibiotic. The blood culture is there to tell you what antibiotic's gonna work. Less so, we send it to narrow antibiotics. So let's say you're treating them with like vanxosin and then the blood culture comes back and shows they're uh, susceptible to like amoxicillin, then you can narrow. But that's not really the main reason. And then the third really small reason is maybe they have like candidemia or some other source of infection that's not bacterial. Blood cultures will help with that. Um, that's pretty much it. So to talk about blood cultures, we have to talk about the story of pneumonia. So in 2002, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid made it one of their core measures to send blood cultures on every admitted patient with pneumonia. So that led in this huge, to this huge increase in blood culture testing from the ED. Um, and it also led to this renewed interest in the usefulness of blood cultures. So a lot of research started happening looking at the usefulness of blood cultures. <laughs> 
pretty much all of the research showed that they're not as useful as we think. We get a lot of false positives. We get very few true, we get a, yeah, very few true positives, and uh, it doesn't really affect management that much. So there's this huge pushback against this core measure, so much so that five years later in 2007, they reversed it. Um, but out of that, we actually got a lot of research on blood cultures and their utility. So this was, I looked at a bunch of different studies on rates of positive blood cultures in all comers with different um, infections. So this is everybody admitted, discharged everybody, no matter what their vital signs were. So in cellulitis, the rate of positive blood cultures is about 2%. In pilo, it's about 5%. In pneumonia, it's about 8%. And then interestingly, the rate of false positives in all comers is 8%. So if you're sending a blood culture on a patient with cellulitis, pilo, pneumonia, you are more likely, you are just as likely, if not more likely, to get a false positive than a true positive. So think about that. When you get to the sepsis syndromes, blood cultures appear to be a little more useful. So in severe sepsis, it's about 30% true positive. And then septic shock, it's like 60%. Um, but the real question is how often do blood cultures change the management in the inpatient floor? And the answer in all the studies was less than 1%. So most of the studies were like 0.2% of the time blood cultures actually change the management. Um, some other research that came out of this was they're like, okay, so we have to be able to identify who really will benefit from blood cultures. So people looked for things that were associated with bacteremia or, you know, true positive blood cultures. Uh, nothing was, one paper tried to make a score, but nothing was super, like, I don't know, nothing was very accurate. Um, it's stuff that we already know, like positive SIRS, chills, like rigors as opposed to fever, hypotension, so septic shock. Uh, and then a really high fever, we're all associated. And then clinical impression. So if you asked a doctor, would you be surprised if that guy had bacteremia, and they said no, then they probably had bacteremia. Uh, but none of this stuff was like so well associated that you could use it like, oh, let's make a score. If they have this, this, and this, you should send blood cultures. Um, they found tachycardia, fever, white count, none of that was associated with a positive blood culture. Uh, so I looked at the guidelines. The, guide, the IDSA recommends sending blood cultures on uh, severe bacterial infections, which they don't really define, um, and then on immunocompromised patients. So neutropenia, anyone with end-stage organ failure, so ESRD cirrhosis, anyone with asplenia, so our sickle cell patients, um, they do recommend blood culture testing. And then the surviving sepsis campaign, the people that brought us like the new sepsis bundle that CMS core measure, they recommend it in severe sepsis and septic shock, um, not in all comers with sepsis. So my conclusion of who really needs blood cultures, I think severe sepsis and septic shock, they're more likely to be true positive than false positive, so I think they're helpful. Immunocompromise, and this is like truly immunocompromised, not patients with diabetes. I don't think that's true immunocompromise. Um, if you're concerned for resistance, so somebody's chart says they have a history of ESBL or they came from a nursing home, something like that, yeah, I think it makes sense to send a blood culture. And then if you can, you know, piece together a clinical bacteremic picture, maybe they have rigors and a high fever, you can send it if you want. Um, the thing I will say, if you're going to send blood cultures, send blood cultures. Don't like half-ass it and like put, you know, two ml in one tube and tape it to their bed. You have to send at least 10 ml in both uh, bottles, and most people actually recommend 20 to 30. That's a ton. That's like you're sitting there bleeding the patient for a while. Uh, you're supposed to do it with the, an the aerobic first, because there's air in the line, and that'll get the air out, and then you do the anaerobic bottle. Uh, and then I read that the sooner you send it, the more likely they're going to be true positive. So if you're taping it to the bed, that's actually... It's kind of like a VBG in that way, where you should actually try to get it off quickly. Um, yeah. So let's go back to some funny chief complaints. <laughs> I like to think these guys were standing in line together, and they were like, he's like, you know, tell him your eye hurts. That's how you get in quicker. <laughs> um, this kid got sent to the ED for being an adolescent. <laughs> Uh, this person got sent to the ED for being elderly. <laughs> this guy was great. 73, still going strong. 
<laughs> this guy I actually saw in CCT. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to help him with his. Uh, <laughs> All right. So third thing. Who really needs a C collar? Um, so you're working in CCT. Uh, they roll in a patient, they say, Doc, she's in an MBC. She's just sitting there smiling at you like this, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> They're like thrashing around in the bed, the sea collar is like pushing their nose up. They're screaming at you, they're drunk. So you want to know, do they really need that sea collar? Can I take it off? Um, before we talk about that, so there's a I don't know if I could call it a growing body of evidence, but there is some evidence that, C that questions the benefit of C-collars. Um, some say maybe it's not beneficial, some even go far enough to say it's harmful. Um, the stuff that I've read, the arguments against it are uh, C-collars don't prevent the movement that we want them to. Uh, one cadaver study actually showed that it separates C1 on C2 by seven millimeters, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, they increase ICP, they lead to like aspiration. Um, and then there was this study where they looked at patients in Malaysia who had spinal injury and patients in the US who had spinal injury. In Malaysia, they don't use C collars at all. In the US, we put them on everybody. And they actually found neurologic outcomes were worse in the US in patients with similar injuries. All of this is kind of circumstantial evidence. It's not really good evidence. And all of the major guidelines still recommend C collars on trauma patients. So don't go around ripping C collars off being like, there's no evidence behind this. Uh, but it's something to consider. So how do we usually clear C-collars in CCT? We use the nexus criteria. Um, so you have to see if there's a focal neurologic deficit, altered consciousness, distracting injury, intoxication, midline C-spine tenderness. Um, if they don't have any of these, you can take their C-collar off and not do a CAT scan. My issue with nexus criteria is it's super vague uh, and it's pretty subjective. So is that a distracting injury? Is that a distracting injury? Um, is that person intoxicated? <laughs> is that person intoxicated? <laughs> I don't know. And then midline C-spine tenderness. Everybody has midline C-spine tenderness. If you push on their C-spine, they're going to say it hurts. I've literally never met anyone that did not say, yeah, that hurts. Uh, the other issue with nexus criteria, so the evidence, some people question how sensitive it is. Um, it's still recommended for use, but there is a question of its sensitivity. Uh, so my answer is use the Canadian C-spine rule. It's just as recommended, as just as much evidence behind it as nexus. Um, it's actually more sensitive and more specific, and I think it's far less subjective, um, and it can actually help you clear more C-colors than the nexus criteria. So... You have to look on MD Calc. There's a lot of different things to it, but it lays out exactly what you need to know, and there's no like subjective gray area. So you ask, does a patient have a high-risk criteria? And that's like, they're over 65, they flew through a windshield, they fell off a building. Stuff that's like pretty obviously high-risk. Um, if they do not, then you move to the next one. You say, do you have a low-risk criteria? And this could be anything from just sitting up in the ED to walking on scene. So pretty low, like pretty easy stuff to get to. Then you ask them to turn their head from side to side, and if they can, then you can clear their C-spine. Uh, this is what I like to use. I think it is much more useful, much less subjective, and it actually has better evidence behind it than Nexus. Uh, the best part, you can use it on intoxicated patients. So the only criteria that they, um, the only exclusion criteria was uh, GCS below 15. So they use it on intoxicated patients, but if their GCS was 15, it's fine. Um, so my conclusion about this, who really needs a C collar? People who fail the Canadian C-spine rule. And then I would say, and you think they have a fracture. So if a 70-year-old guy comes in and he like slipped and fell, I, I don't know, something very minor happened, you're like, I bet you don't have a fracture, but you're over 70, and the Canadian C-spine rule says I can't take your C-collar off. That's actually not what it says. It doesn't say you need a CAT scan, Dr. Schechter. I just want to point out, those rules are not for who needs a C-collar, it's for who needs a CAT scan. Right. Two completely independent. That's what I mean, yeah. So it's not, this rule is not telling you uh, if you fail the rule, you 100% need a CAT scan. It's saying you can't use this rule to say you don't need a CAT scan, if that makes sense. So it's not 
everyone that fills this rule does not automatically need a CAT scan. You're still a doctor. You're still able to make a, your own clinical decision about whether they need a CAT scan. So it's a what's called a one directional rule, as in if it if they like meet all the criteria, you can say they don't need a CAT scan. But if they don't meet the criteria, that doesn't mean they need a CAT scan. It's confusing, but all right. Last thing: uh, should we be intubating patients in cardiac arrest? So when you're in a code and you're the one going to intubate, it's like this. Your head's like flying around everywhere. You're trying to get the tube in. You don't want to tell them to stop compressions, but it's, it's usually a disaster. So do we really need to be focusing on intubating these patients, or is there another way? So there were two really large randomized control trials in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest looking at intubating versus placing an LMA. Um, one of them found there's no difference in outcomes, and the other one found that patients who were intubated were, was associated with worse outcomes. Um, they're pretty big trials. They're pretty well done. Uh, they had relatively good success rates of intubation, so you could probably um, generalize it to inpatient. But if you're saying, wait, I'm a doctor. I'm not an EMS worker. I'm better than all those people at intubating. This doesn't apply to me. There is some data on in-hospital cardiac arrest and intubation and survival, and it also shows worse outcomes in patients who are intubated. Um, there are obviously a ton of confounders here, so it's not like intubation led to a worse outcome, but all the evidence we have shows that intubation is associated with worse outcomes. So this makes sense, right? ACLS, the only things we found that actually help in cardiac arrest are high-quality chest compressions and defibrillation. Everything else has been found to not really work. Epinephrine, um, intubation now. So in 2005 or something, ACLS had to change their guidelines and they recommended uh, decreasing the rate of ventilation because it actually led to worse outcomes. So that's kind of further evidence that ventilation is not your primary concern. Um, so if your intubation is disrupting chest compressions, then it's probably not useful. So my conclusion is, should we be intubating? No, just put an LMA in. Put the LMA in during the code, and then when the patient gets ROSC, then you can focus on intubating them. Um, so that's it. Who really needs a troponin? I'd say definitely patients you suspect ACS. Everyone else, just think about what you're going to do with the answer. So a few comments for the LMAs. First of all, there's one study out there that shows it could help you individuals. Put an LMAs in and blew them up, and they showed it's the pressure through the cuff, push it on the carotid to stop the blood flow to the brain. That was in you pigs. Can heart, but you won't have any brain flow. It's questionable because it was not done in cardiac arrest, and it doesn't change the outcome, but that's one suggestion. And then probably said, so you should just be bagging them and not doing anything. Yeah. So you don't have to stop the pressure at all. Yeah, so there's also studies on doing bag valve mask ventilation versus intubation, and they also show bag valve mask is better. So I believe that DVM is just the best way to do fastest, it's yeah. easiest, and you don't have to stop. But if someone has a big bushy beard or whatever you really want to get an airway in, then I think an LMA is better than intubation. But there's just a lot of confounders out there that you have to take into consideration. I looked at, I know what you're talking about with the decreased carotid flow. I think it was actually in pigs that they did it, and it's never really been like proven in, in humans. So I don't know. Yeah, you can use a king tube. You can use different things. Um, Intubate with the bougie. Okay. Yeah, that's different. So that's not the airway, that's just bag them and do this and resuscitate. If you're not going to get ROS, you're not going to get ROS for the intubate or not. And when you get ROS, you can then get your secure your airway. Yeah. Yeah, if the guy like came from a steakhouse and they're like, he's choking on a steak, you should probably intubate them. Um, <laughs> who really needs blood cultures? All these patients could potentially benefit from blood cultures. Um, but not all comers with bacterial infection, so everyone with pneumonia, cellulitis that you're going to admit. Um, who really needs a C-collar? Oh, I guess who really needs a CT C-spine? Uh, people who fail the Canadian C-spine rule. And then should we be intubating cardiac arrest patients? My conclusion is no. You can place an LMA or you can bag them. <laughs>
Um, so that's it. I wanted to thank my class of wonderful humans. They're all the classiest people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> all right, questions? This is my baby going over greets. <laughs> Just, just a comment. Yeah. yeah. I think basically what you're kind of getting at is just think about what you're doing and think about the future of what you're doing. So I think no matter, first of all, no matter where you end up on the spectrum of studying for politics, just remember, and I think what Charles was saying earlier, just remember that not all proponents are ACS. It comes from a lot of different places. When you get a positive proponent, pause, think about the patient who's running your own cardiology. Yeah. <laughs> Just think, think about what you should be doing next. And then C-spine, I, I agree. I actually try to use a combination of nexus and C-spine. I think you can kind of use a lot of factors as you're doing it. And the midline tenderness is something I do. It's not the tenderness place necessarily, but I like to have the patient tell me first where their pain is, have them use their hand, and say, where do you feel uh, the pain in your neck? And that can kind of maybe let you analyze it. But I, because I agree, once you put your hand in and you start pressing, so if they're telling you it's kind of on the right side, and use that for what it is. You know, you're obviously going to have a higher risk for a concern in patients for the you know, like that. Yeah, I do that more thing. I do that Nexus, see if you Canadian line. It's like, the young Asian was like really crappy mechanism. Yeah. Like, oh, my seat spot hurts so much. And it's like, well, it's actually nice and positive, but Canadian is just good. Yeah. I like Canadian better. <laughs> Right. If you have a, if your hospital has like a thing in place telling you when to send them, then I think that's fine. Right. And even SEP1, they don't recommend it in all sepsis. They say severe sepsis or septic shock, which is hard because severe sepsis kind of relies on some labs and maybe altered mental sense. So, I mean, it's, it's difficult to tease out, but I would just say if you look at a patient, you say, I wouldn't be surprised if they had severe sepsis, then send blood cultures.